morning. Good morning. Welcome to the October session of the Winter Circle. We are so excited for our event today. You know the purpose of the Winter Circle is to bring in the best and the brightest to talk to us about what it takes to succeed in life. And so it's with that that I'm going to ask Arnav, our eighth grader, to come on up and introduce our speaker. But before he does that, um, remember, our brain is best when it's curious. So let's like, sit up straight, let's be really curious, and let's have a good question and answer period at the end of this. So Arnav, come on up. Hello, my name is Arnav. I am an eighth grader, and I have the privilege to introduce Miss Beth Haretta. She is the first female director of the performance brand and motorsport for an automotive company. Due to her success in automotive finances, she was recruited to be the operations managers for Ashton Martin The Americas. She worked closely with the product team in the UK, managed the dealer network, business of sales, marketing, and service and forge financial partnerships for the company that remains to this day. In 2015, Beth launched Grace Autosport, a professional race team of women who will compete in sports car racing around the world. More than racing, Grace Autosport is an initiative to promote STEM, education for girls. Miss Coretta holds a Bachelor of Science from the Boston University and an MBA from the University of Vermont, which with concentrations of finance and marketing. She was named one of the Auto Week magazine's secret people who will change the car world and a game changer by Sports Business Journal of her work with Grace Autosport. She's on board of the directors of the Motorsport Hall of Fame in America, in Daytona, California, I mean Florida. Uh, she resides near Detroit, Michigan. Let us give Miss Grace Paretta and East Hills welcome. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me here this morning. Um, I took notes last night because I wanted to make sure that uh, I made this as valuable as I could make it. I wish that we did this when I was in school, I'll be honest with you, because you learn so many things and it's hard to necessarily uh, think of why you're learning what you're learning or how you're going to use it and you're, you'll be surprised at how much you'll actually use as much as everybody tells you, why am I studying this? It will all make sense someday. Um, I, the one thing I want to say as sort of the theme is Everyone will ask you what you want to be when you grow up. I still ask myself that. I'm, I'm sure you might, you, your parents might do that as well. The thing is, I could not have dreamed my career for myself. If, if I had asked myself in high school, even in college, what I was going to do, I probably had an answer. And what I've actually done is nothing like what I thought I was going to do. Um, my mom might have guessed it, but I never had any idea. And the reason I, I have had a career that I couldn't have imagined, I couldn't have dreamed, and the reason I've had that career that I've had so far is because I was willing to take chances and people were willing to take a chance on me. And those are really important things, I think, to remember. That you're willing to take chances yourself and hopefully when you're in a position, you can take a chance on someone else because there are people that took a chance on me at different times that led me to each step of the way that made me have this career that I do. So just to kind of, I'll start at the end and then we'll go back a little bit. So I work in racing. I work in motorsports. I worked in automotive for a long time and then eventually found myself my, my way to racing. When I was a kid, I used to watch racing on television. Now, one thing I will say, you guys kind of have the one benefit if you dream of working in the automotive world, you live here. This is Detroit. And there's a lot of cars here, obviously. You, probably you have parents that work somewhat related to the industry or family members who do. I'm from Connecticut. It's not car country. So being a young girl interested in cars, I kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. Thankfully, my parents uh, supported it and <laughs> allowed me to, you know, if I, I, I actually would like buy car magazines and read them cover to cover. There was a reason that I did that. It was a, a way to sort of have a, a, a relationship and communication with my dad and, and kind of my, my male cousins. 
and it stuck with me. I mean, I still talk about cars all the time, and even if I didn't work in automotive or racing, I still would be talking about it because I did before I got here. So it makes sense in some ways because it's something that I've always loved, but it wasn't like, you know, here it's, it's sort of ubiquitous. Everybody has a relationship to cars. They didn't in Connecticut. Um, so I went to school, I went to, I went to business school, and when I finished business school, I actually started working at a car dealership because I figured that I wanted to work in something that I liked. And everyone will say, you know, do something that you like and you'll never work a day in your life. And there's some truth to that. But at the same time, don't get me wrong. Yes, I, I work in racing. It sounds fantastic. There's a lot of hard days as well, right? And I, I'm fond of saying, too, you could have the best job in the world on paper, but if you don't like the people that you're working with, you're going to be miserable. But you could be out working in a farm in a very difficult, you know, digging ditches all day. But if you like the people that are on either side of you, it's actually going to be much more bearable. So you don't want to necessarily, you want to, you want to get yourself in the right opportunity and around the right people and doing the things that, that make you happiest and, you, and you'll thrive from there. But the way that I was able to sort of go from step to step is because people took a chance on me. So I wind up working at a car dealership and I, of course, had been reading car magazines my whole life. So I kind of, like I say, kind of knew a lot about a lot of different cars. And a gentleman came in one day who worked for Audi. And uh, again, this is in Connecticut. And he said, and we started chatting. And he's like, you know, so what do you want to do? And I said, well, you know, I finished graduate school. And he said, you finished, you're, you have a graduate degree. What are you doing here? I said, well, I'm trying to learn the business. So he said, give me your resume. So I gave him my resume. And a week later, I got a call from Volkswagen Group, which at the time was based here in Auburn Hills. And not to date myself. And, uh, and they said, you know, we'd like to talk to you. And so I went and had an interview in, this was in New Jersey. And they said, okay, you know, you've never done this kind of work before, but we're going to take a chance on you. And that's when I figured out that the, I think the most important skills that you can have, you know, yes, study math, yes, study English, yes, study history, all those things are important. But the most important things ever are interest, aptitude, and attitude. So you have to be interested in whatever you're doing. You have to be aptitude. I mean, you're smart. None of you would be here this morning if you didn't care about studies. And attitude. You have to have the right attitude about yourself, about others, about the work that you're doing. So those three things, interest, aptitude, and attitude, you can do anything. And that kind of kept coming up through my career. So they took a chance on me because I didn't have the experience. Everybody else, that all, when I did take that job with Volkswagen Group, I wound up working in finance, so Volkswagen Credit. So I worked with Volkswagen, Audi, Bentley, and Lamborghini dealers in finance. So it sounds cool on paper. My business card had really cool logos on it, but it was finance. So it was learning a lot about the business of automotive. Now again, here, you all can learn about the business of automotive pretty easily. A little different in Connecticut. But somebody took a chance on me and I took that job, and I had that job for maybe three or four years. And then I met somebody from Aston Martin. I was at an industry dinner, and I met uh, the vice president of Aston Martin, British car company, you probably know it, James Bond drives them. And we were chatting about automotive finance, and they didn't have anybody, and here I was working in automotive finance, remember Bentley, so Bentley similar to Aston Martin. And so he started asking me questions about finance, and he said, would you be willing to talk about a job with us? And I learned, that if anybody asks you, do you want to talk about a job, you say yes. You might not really want the job. You might love the job you have, but you say yes, because you want to find out what else is out there. If anything, it keeps your skills sharp. How do you talk to people? So I talked to him, and he said, well, we need an operations person for North America. I hadn't done that yet before. I was working in finance. But he said, well, you know, you sound like you have the interest, you have the aptitude, and you have the right attitude. I'd like to take a chance on you. Would you like to join our company? Sure. So, and, that, and that's not, not to say that I didn't like what I was doing, but I knew that by going, I was at a very big company, it's Volkswagen, and then I had this opportunity to go to a small company, which might seem counterintuitive to a lot of people, but a small company gives you a lot of opportunity. Because you know, you hear the, the phrase, like I'm wearing every hat, well, every hat gives, teaches you new things. So I knew that if I went to a smaller company for a little bit, I would probably learn a lot more in a, qu a shorter amount of time than if I had stayed at Volkswagen. So sure enough, he took a chance on me, and I went to Aston Martin, and I was there for a few years. And what was great about that job is it was a very small company. I did a lot of different things. I learned a lot, but it was also very visible. 
So I should back up and say, um, when I was in graduate school, because I kind of kept an eye on the automotive industry because it was interesting to me, there were two people that I always, that I sort of were kind of like heroes that I thought that in the automotive business. One of them was Sergio Marchionne, and the other one, who at the time was in, in Italy, we, we did not have, he wasn't connected to Chrysler yet, so he was Fiat, but not Chrysler. The other one was Roger Penske, familiar name to all of you, locals. Um, I was in graduate school in Vermont, so these were things that I just knew from you know, reading magazines, reading the Wall Street Journal. And they were two people that I thought, like, wow, I, these people are interesting. I like following their careers. I, I feel like I could learn from them. So they're just sort of in the back of my mind, heroes. So go back to, I'm working for Aston Martin. And then four years later, I'm at another industry dinner. Automotive News Magazine. You know Automotive News. You've probably seen a copy of it. Um, I was at a dinner in New York City. And I met the head, at the time, the head of Dodge the head of all design, a guy called Ralph Gilles. And we're at this dinner, and I have my name tag that said Aston Martin, and he's like, oh, I love Aston Martins. And I said, of course you do, you're a designer. They're very pretty cars. And um, so we started chatting, exchanged business cards, as you do, and the next day you send that email, it was lovely to meet you. Yes, it was lovely to meet you too. And thinking like, oh, you know, I'll never hear from him again. And uh, I'm kidding, of course we would. Wouldn't be here today if that didn't happen. Um, so he had never driven an Aston Martin, and I said, hey, next time I come to Michigan, why don't you drive a, an Aston Martin? He said, I would love to do that. That's what we do in the car business. We kind of hook each other up with, try, try our new car. Now try our new car. And I will say, and you know this, not everybody in the car business is a car person. So those of us who are, we all know each other. We have like a little secret handshake because not everybody really is passionate about it. But those of us who are have a secret handshake, and we all know each other. So. Here it was, maybe six months later, and I'm showing Ralph Gilles this brand new Aston Martin, the company I work for, and he's like, oh, this is fantastic. He's like, would you ever consider talking to me about a job? And I said, yes. Sure, I loved what I was doing. I had this fantastic job. I was flying all around the country, flying all around the world, helping the factory make decisions on the new designs of the Aston Martins. I was like, yeah, I'll talk to you. So that's when I found out that Sergio Marchionne, who figured earlier in the story, had this idea to spin off the performance brand of Fiat Chrysler called SRT. And they wanted to, ha to have it be its own division, and they needed somebody to run it. And with that SRT responsibility came the responsibility of racing. So I'd been a super fan of racing my whole life. I'd helped some teams here and there, but now all of a sudden on the table, We'd like you to run this performance brand and all of our racing endeavors. Now, I'd never done that before, but they took a chance on me. And I will say, I took a chance on myself because admittedly, that's a little scary. Somebody's asking you to do something that you've never done before. It's like, ugh, can I do that? But they were willing to offer me, they thought I could, so if somebody else thinks you could, you know, and they're willing to help you along the, help you make it happen, then you say yes. So here it was in 2011, I moved from Connecticut to Michigan to be your neighbor. And with this job comes the ability to run this performance brand, run race teams, figure out the business of racing. And it didn't occur to me until somebody pointed it out to me that no woman had ever done that before. But as the girls in the room will notice, will we'll probably agree, we kind of forget that we're girls until somebody points it out. We're just going about our business. We're just getting our homework done. We're getting our work done. We're doing our jobs until someone else says, hey, you know, there's never been a woman that's done that before. And you say, cool. And then you get on with what you're doing. Um, there still hasn't been another woman since me, but hopefully soon there will be more. So now I was in a position, people had taken chances on me, and the reason they had is because I had the interest, the attitude, and the aptitude. The skills can be taught. You want to hire the person. You want to be the personality that they're looking for, that you have the energy and that you have the interest to get the job done. The skills, they'll come. You'll learn the skills. 
you're, you're, you're learning new skills right now that you didn't know a month ago. So then I was in a position where I could take a chance on other people because that's the key. As you start climbing up that ladder and you get one more rung up, one more rung up, you have to then pull somebody up just like somebody pulled me up. I think that's everybody's responsibility. So when you get to that place when you can actually do some good for somebody else, you should, and it feels good to do that and give somebody, take a chance on somebody else like somebody did for me. So here I was at Fiat Chrysler and I had to build a race team because we were gonna go racing with the Viper and we were gonna be racing in North America and then going back to Le Mans, this big 24 hour race in France that's very famous, very big deal. So, and uh, the Viper had raced there before, so there was a lot of people that were very excited about that. It was coming back, but we had to build a race team. So we had engineers and people and drivers and mechanics and uh, public relations people, and we had to pick each of these people. And anytime, it's like you know, building a, a baseball team, anything, any sort of team, when you're starting from scratch, you're like, where do we start? So we started kind of interviewing people and some people did have experience, some people had a little bit of experience, medium experience. We started realizing that it was a, a great opportunity to be able to build something from a clean sheet of paper and we could make it whatever we wanted. So we hired people based on their personalities. And a race team, I don't know if you know how big a race team is, how big a Viper race team is, but I have a picture of the team this is what a race team looks like. This is how many people it takes to make that car go fast, sometimes for 24 hours at a time. So they built the car, they run the car, there's drivers in there, there's PR, marketing, but it's a lot of people. That's, that's a race team. So kind of like you look at a football team all together, it's really big. Everybody focuses on the quarterback, but there's so much more to it. Everybody focuses on the driver, ah, dime a dozen. It's all the other people. They build the car, they run the car. So that's the team. So we built that team from scratch, took a chance on some of them. And this team started, its first races were in 2012 in the fall, in August 2012. We ran four races in 2012. And two years later, this photo was taken when we won the championship. Went from nowhere to winning a championship with people that, had, that we, that had never met before, and we built them because they all had the right attitude. And this series that we were competing in was very competitive. We were up against Porsche, Ferrari, Corvette, and those teams had been together for years and years and years. They knew each other, they knew how to work together. We had some growing pains that first year, right? Because like anything, it's like, you know, you're just you're getting to know each other, getting to know how each other works. But that whole process was a lot quicker because we had the right people working together and they got their skills. And that was a, that was a remarkable achievement. Um, one of my other opportunities, because of that Fiat Chrysler thing, and we'll get to where I am now, but the Fiat Chrysler thing was really amazing because Sergio Marchioni, one of my business school heroes, winds up hiring me at Fiat Chrysler. And part of my responsibility was to run the NASCAR program with Roger Penske. So my two people that I was kind of keeping an eye on when I was in business school, now all of a sudden I'm working with them <laughs> and yelling at them back and forth and uh, you know, getting into arguments about business stuff. Um, I actually knew Roger from my Aston Martin days because he was an Aston Martin dealer. But uh, we put a lot of things in place when I was running the NASCAR program and this is with Dodge and in 2012 we won the championship. Dodge hadn't won the championship since 1975. So here I came in, we, with, the, with the team, moved some people around, moved some resources around and in 2012, we won the NASCAR Cup Championship, and it was Roger Penske's first NASCAR win. That is a NASCAR Championship ring, sized for ladies, because otherwise they're big and they look like those ridiculous Super Bowl rings that you'd never wear. You know, you wouldn't like be walking through Kroger with it because people would be like, what the hell? So, NASCAR Cup ring, anyone can check it out. It's got a race car on the side, and it's got my name on the other side, so it's legit. And you wind, up, my, you wind up finding yourself in strange, I have a NASCAR championship ring. You think I would have thought that in high school? I'm from Connecticut. No, that's not what we do. But 
I was willing to take chances and say yes when people said, do you want to talk? And some people took chances on me. So then here I am and I realize, okay, now I've got to do, like they, everybody, everybody says, pay it forward. So I'm this motorsport director at Fiat Chrysler. <clears throat> There's some changes. They're trying to shut down motorsport programs. I had to sh so we win this championship and then I had to shut it down, shut down the program. That was highlight. That's a story for another day. Um, we win this championship. And then two days later, I had to shut down the program. So that's, that's business, right? That's like, so you have the passion of it, and then you've got business people weighing in, like, well, we, I think we're going to put that on the shelf. We won. We don't need to win again. Like, OK, so decisions were made, and then I had to do that. So I decided, you know what? I want to do something else. And here I am working at a car company, and I realized that we need more engineers. We need to get people more excited about engineering earlier in the process. You can't decide to become an engineer when you're 30. You kind of have to start studying it a little earlier. And I thought, OK. What's a way that we can get people's attention and get kids' attention to why engineering is cool and technology is cool? And the idea was, OK, there aren't that many. There are women who work in racing. We all know each other, because there's not that many, but there's some. And I had this idea that what if we put a team together of all women to race, all on the same team, and we can, in addition to racing, go and talk to schools and talk to corporations and try to encourage uh, the corporations to support our endeavors to reach kids and explain to them that uh, that this is a career path, something to aspire to. Because the nice thing is, a lot of these people are part time, and a lot of people on race teams, like they might just go work for a race team for two years, and then they work at General Motors in vehicle dynamics. They're transferable skills, as I like to say. Like, there's no other sport where you could do that. You're not going to go be center fielder for the Tigers and then go be center fielder for. Ford, they're not hiring center fielders, but they are hiring mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, uh, chassis dynam uh, dynamicists. The, our chief aerodynamicist has a PhD in aerodynamics. Like, there's no other sport that has like that kind of stuff. And it's basically, you know, it, it, if more people knew how technical racing is, it's it's sports for geeks like me. So we started this race team of all women and we should be on the grid soon. I've been working a little bit with the Henry Ford as well on their new exhibit, which is kind of exciting. But again, these were all things that were interesting to me as a kid. I used to watch racing. I used to read car magazines. And then there I was years later making decisions on cars, hiring people to be on a race team and winning racing championships. So take chances. And then when you have the opportunity, take chances on others. It's the right attitude aptitude and interest and you can do anything and don't be afraid to change careers and change jobs because it all ties together all right, all right. any questions yes you talked a lot about like your successes and like i really admire that but were there any like times that you like struggled and like how did you like get out of that the shutting down of the racing programs was really hard because uh, we built the, the brand, we built, I'll, I admit, I might have been na somewhat naive to some of the corporate things that go on, some of the challenges. I don't want to say like the business challenges because every business has challenges, but um, that no matter how successful we were, it's like it didn't matter enough. Like that wasn't the, the, the you know, so it, it got very, um, frustrating to work really hard, have a team that worked really hard and had results, and that it's, there were still other people weighing in on decisions to, to then all of a sudden sort of like pull the plug on things. And that happened a couple of times over the, uh, the course of three years. And it was, it was tough because, I mean, literally having to call people and fire them effectively and not having a good reason to really, I mean, say, you know, you tow the company line and you say you have to let them go, but it's hard for them to understand too because they performed well, they did what was asked of them, but you still have to let them go. And I admit that that was really, that was really tough even mentally because you're thinking like, I, I couldn't have worked any harder, I couldn't have done, you know, what else could I have done? And um, it took a while to realize, okay, there was nothing that I could have done in that setting other than I could have maybe not been so disappointed by it because I probably let that disappointment get to me for a while and that was actually part of the reason why I left the company because it was just like, I'll work for myself, which I do. But, you know, sometimes things are beyond your control, but what is in your control is how you handle it. Yes? How much risk did it take you to get to that spot? 
Oh, uh, so actually, I got to the spot a little faster than normal. I walked into a car dealership after graduate school in 2003, and, by two th and in 2011, I was a director at Fiat Chrysler. That's highly unusual. Um, again, it's meeting the right people, and I think it's the reason that acceleration was because I'd been reading the car magazines. You know, have, have you ever heard the phrase 10,000 hours? Malcolm Gladwell book. It's the idea that it takes you 10,000 hours to become an, an expert. So if all of a sudden you started playing violin today, if you played for 10,000 hours, you would, you would be an expert violinist. And they say that about any sort of thing. And so I think by the, even though I started in 2003, I probably had already had years of that knowledge that kind of helped me leapfrog. But yeah, I walked into a dealership in 2003 and walked into my office at Chrysler eight years later. I would say it should take twice that, like 10, 15 years. Any more questions? Kevin, for one more. We have one more question. All right, how about another round of applause? <laughs> wow. Have the right interests, the right attitude, and the right aptitude. Three, like. Uh, you know, stepping stones to uh, your dreams. Now it's our job to go out to our classrooms, to our extracurricular activities, to our homes, and go out and be the best that we can be. So go out and have a great day.